Berg, uh, welcome to this uh, webinar from Class 61J, 50 days on, uh, what uh, an update. Um, I'm very glad to be doing this. I found the last webinar that Class 61J did extremely helpful. I was going to say enjoyable, but I don't know really whether that's the right verb to be using at the moment, but uh, it was certainly very helpful in terms of um, updating me on conditions in Israel its morale, its mood, its politics, and, and um, more than you will get just by your average reading. I think that's what we're trying to do. Um, now, uh, we have seen, of course, it's been a big week, two tranches of hostages released and an expected third tonight. So there is a great deal to catch up on. And I'll introduce you to our two guests shortly, Itai Flesher and Rabbi Elahan Miller. But I would now like to start tonight by hearing from Iris Haggai Lineado. Uh, Iris thinks her parents are in Gaza. They haven't been released yet. We do know that. She lives in Singapore and she's currently in Israel. And we pre-recorded her earlier with uh, Plus 61J's contributing editor, Shaha Bula. So let's have a listen. So my parents are very into health and they eat uh, like a vegan, whole food, plant-based diet. They, they very much believe in a healthy mind, healthy uh, body. And every day they take a walk together outside of the kibbutz in the fields. And, you know, that Saturday was no different. And I saw in, in, uh, in my phone that there's red alert in that area, which is nothing unusual. Unfortunately, rockets have been... Uh, you know, being shot towards them for like 15, 20 years. Um, so I expected when I asked them how they're doing, I expected like a very nonchalant answer as always. But this time they told me they, they are laying face down on the fields and that they are seeing tons of rockets uh, over their heads. I asked them in our group chat in WhatsApp, I asked them uh, how far they are from the kibbutz sorry, from their home in the kibbutz, they said two kilometers. And that was the last time I heard from my mom. But I didn't know that then. I told her to tell me um, when she's home. She's, she didn't answer that minute. And meanwhile, I'm speaking to my friends on our group chat from the kibbutz. And they're telling me that, uh, you know, they are in the safe rooms and uh, that uh, there are terrorists in the kibbutz. And during that time, we believe the army will come and save them, basically. Um, and then I see it's 7.20, and my parents didn't tell me they're home yet. And uh, they're very fit. It doesn't take them uh, 30 minutes to get home. It's only two kilometers. So I started calling them. There was no answer. I start calling my brothers and sisters in Israel. Nobody's answering me. Uh, they don't, my brother and, brother and sister don't live in uh, in the kibbutz, but they were sleeping. It was early, it was 7.20. And then 7.30, I see my friends saying that the whole kibbutz is full of terrorists and that they're burning their houses, they're shooting them. Um, the nightmare basically began and through all of that, I tried to find out what's going on with my parents. Long story short, a day after, uh, I found out that my mom called the kibbutz paramedic and she said that they were both shot by terrorists on a motorcycle and that my dad is shot really bad. She thinks he's dead and that she was shot as well. And she asked for medical assistance. The paramedic tried to send the ambulance to her, but the, but the terrorist um, came into the kibbutz, shot the tires of the ambulance and put it on fire. So he couldn't um, send the ambulance to her. And basically that's the last thing I know. Um, yeah. So I am assuming they took my dad's body as hostage. I also heard a recording of my mom talking to, uh, Mada, um, which is, um, I'm not sure how you say that in English. Maybe you can correct me. Um, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I heard the recording. She was very graphic about what happened to my dad. And he's definitely, he was definitely murdered. But um, <clears throat> there is no body. So they, my dad's body is hostage right now. 
and my mom, I don't know if she's dead or alive, basically. I have no proof of life, no intelligence about her, absolutely nothing about my mom. Um, and yeah, that's basically what I have right now, which is- That's, that's what's pregnant. the brief that you received from the Israeli government as well, that they don't have any further information? Yeah, most of the information came from us. Um, you know, the, the Israeli government at first wasn't really there. Um, it was a whole mess, you know, so many bodies, so many murders, so many hostages. I mean, this is crazy. It never happened since the Holocaust, um, which it was basically the Holocaust, um, with the state of Israel in place, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, but yeah, all, all the Israeli government has is what I told them and also um, a video that they think might be my dad's body. They sent it to me yesterday and uh, I do think it's him, but I didn't really need that to confirm what I, what I know, sorry, <clears throat> about my dad because I heard my mom's recording. But yeah, all, all they know is what I just told you. Basically, that's all we know. And the video that you just saw is from uh, October 7th? Yes, it's from October 7th. Um, it's from this guy who walked his way to the kibbutz, you know, nobody bothering him. He just walked. It's a 30 minute video when you see at a certain part, like a really fast five seconds, a truck going by and you can see my dad's body <clears throat> on the truck. Um, but it's really, really fast. Like if I saw the video without the Israeli government telling me about it, I would never know that there's even a body on that truck. Um, and that's what, uh, they gave me yesterday. That's the newest information basically. But again, I have no body. Like I can't really close that chapter. I, I know of his death, but I can't bury him. Um, it's, it's really very, very crazy nightmare you mentioned that your mom was is american canadian and i know that uh, you met president biden several days couple of days after uh, uh, and this october 7th can you tell me a little bit about this meeting um the dynamics sure um my dad is also american we are also american citizen um he first you know, dedicated almost two hours to us, which is amazing. I mean, he's the president of the United States. And during that time, we didn't get any, um, any communication from the Israeli government, from anybody. Um, so it was really amazing to, to get that type of uh, hug, I guess I would call it, because he didn't really have information, you know? But just the fact that somebody saw us um, because our frustration was was ridiculous. I mean, there are really no words to what we felt uh, the first uh, week. And, um, you know, as I said, he didn't really have information, but what he was really clear about is that he stands behind Israel. Um, while he may do things differently, he completely trusts the Israeli system and that it's Israeli soil at the end of the day. And um, he respects that. And um, that's basically what his message was. But he really went family and family and listened to our stories and uh, talked about, you know, what he's, uh, he's been through. Um, so yeah, it was, it was really special. I mean, I could say I spoke to President Biden, so I can thank my parents for that. But, um, you know, it'll be interesting if we could speak to him again, actually, now that uh, I can't believe I'm saying this, but uh, today, 49 days um, and uh, 49 days after, which is crazy. I, I never believed it would be so long. And that was uh, Iris, um, Iris Haggai Lineado with a really well, a nerve wracking, poignant account of what she knows and what she doesn't know. And just um, the, the business of managing that degree of lack of knowledge, I think is really quite something. Uh, look, I'm delighted to welcome um, Rabbi Elahan Miller, 
and um, Ite Flesher. Rabbi Eberhan uh, Elahan is uh, based in Jerusalem. He's a rabbi in Jerusalem. Uh, he writes, he's a content creator. He teaches Jewish studies and Arabic at the Hartman Institute and the Pardes Institute of Jewish Studies. He was a journalist like me, decided he'd go to better things. In 2017, he created his own online educational platform called People of the Book to educate Arab speaking audiences about the Jewish faith and culture, hopefully to promote better understanding and more peaceful coexistence. So I'll be very keen to hear his thoughts. And Ite, uh, who I think we're used to seeing, is the Jerusalem correspondent for Plus 61J. He moved to Israel in 2018 from Melbourne, where he was a high school teacher. He was until recently the education director at Seeds of Peace. And that, again, is another admirable movement that uh, brings together Israeli and Palestinian teenagers to work towards peace uh, and justice and equality. So I'll again be very, I'll be fascinated to hear how he thinks things are going. So look, welcome to you both. And maybe uh, Ita, I'll go to you first. How are people responding um, as these days, as you know, as um, we heard 50 days on, um, how are people pacing themselves, if I can put it like that? Um, if I had to describe it in a word, I'd say roller coaster of emotions. Um, mm. I'll say like on Friday night, you know, we were told at four o'clock that the first children would be released. And I'm a father of two children who are very similar ages to, to some of the kids who were released on Friday night. And and so like the rest of the country, we we sat in front of the TV and until, you know, they got on the, the vans from from the rougher crossing through, took us took about two and a half hours until we first, you know, saw footage of them and we were waiting to have Shabbat dinner, you know, as we do every Friday night. And I was just like, we can't start Shabbat dinner until I see these kids are okay. Like I just, I just couldn't start the meal until we saw anything, even for half a second. I just wanted to see that, you know, they were out. And then I, you know, we start always, we start Shabbat dinner with blessing our children, um, which is something we do before the meal. And it, it was hard to, to, do that with a dry eye, let's mm. say, um, because, and I think, I think so many parents feel that I think every Israeli, maybe every Jew on this call as well has seen the, the, the footage of Ohad Munda, you know, a nine-year-old kid mm. who, um, when he met his father at the Schneider hospital and, um, you know, the huge hug they give each other. Mm. And then, and then you see him playing with a Rubik's cube, yes. <laughs> um, which is like, you know, what nine-year-olds are meant to do. They're not meant to be in Hamas captivity. They're meant to be playing with a Rubik's Cube. And you know, I've got an 11-year-old, so I, I know exactly what that feels like. And then, you know, or had missed his ninth birthday. So they they brought a few of these friends to the hospital and they gave them all ice cream and had an ice cream party. And it was just so normal, like just seeing a nine-year-old doing something normal. And that felt like... I guess such a relief after so many days of like abnormality. He's finally a nine-year-old kid doing something normal. So um, yeah, all those emotions are sort of running within me at the moment. How how are your your own kids taking it? Would you say? Um, look, my own kids. I I keep them away from the news, which is weird as a journalist. You know, you, you often think kids of journalists would be watching the news all the time, but I. I never watch TV in front of them. I, I try not to, you know, make them aware of some of the the details of, of what happened on October 7th because I don't think that's particularly good. Like they know what they need to know, you know, and I yeah. think they're they're relatively okay. Yeah. Um, and are there differences? Like would you say on this roller coaster, um, do you have some friends who, who worry you, you know, because they're not managing on others who are, I mean, it was resilience or otherwise on display as well. I would imagine it is, but I wonder. Yeah, um, look, I'm, I'm very lucky that I didn't have anyone that I personally know killed on October 7th, and I don't have any direct family members that have been called up, but pretty much all of my friends do have direct family members who have been called up to the army, so they're obviously terrified. You know, I read a poem today from a friend. She's an Israeli mother, and she talked about you know, how we, we often think of soldiers as people wearing uniform, but we're actually all soldiers at the moment because 
even though a lot of us are doing our daily lives and not wearing uniform, we're all volunteering or we're all caring for someone or we're all filling in the gap of someone that's gone to the front. Um, and so, you know, there, there's a sense of, you know, I am also volunteering several hours a week as well. Um, it's, it's where, just where, like, are you where are you volunteering? In? So, so I'm, I'm not very good with, with fighting Hamas, but I'm very good at playing guitar. Um, so, um, I, uh, I've been volunteering in, there's, there's about 200 evacuate, 200,000 evacuees across the country. So I've been going every Sunday night to a different hotel in Jerusalem with a band of like four friends. And we play like a whole lot of classical Hebrew songs and it just makes the people there really happy. And we do some kids songs as well. And that's to wow. me what I can offer during, during the war. And I've done a few, you know, collecting food and, packages for soldiers and things like that as well. Oh, and Rabbi Eva Elahan, how would you say, how, how do you sketch the range of emotions that you've seen or felt? Well, um, I mean, for those of us who grew up here, it's, uh, it's a bit of a flashback in a kind of sad way. Um, I was 13 when, when a soldier called Nachshon Vaxman was kidnapped by Hamas. This was 1994. Uh, just as Hamas was starting sort of to gain notoriety in Israel. And he was from my neighborhood, the neighborhood, the suburb of Jerusalem that I grew up in. And it was um, Itzhak Rabin, who was the prime minister at that time, sent in a sort of a rescue squad of uh, elite soldiers to rescue him. And it was also a Friday night. And we were sitting sort of at the edge of our seats, especially people who knew the family like like we did. And uh, unfortunately, it was a it was a failed rescue mission and he was killed. And an another officer was killed. And um, it was very heart-wrenching. Hamas had released a video of him speaking to the public. Um, so we knew that he was alive and people knew kind of, uh, the, the army knew where he was being held. And uh, then we had a rerun in 2011 with Gilad Shalit and mm -hmm. uh, five or six years in captivity that ended in, in, in this massive prisoner swap. And it's just like we're back in that place again, and it's just uh, gut wrenching and tragic. And you know, when you follow the TV here, you kind of remember the anticipation and the excitement of people coming back, but you're also kind of sickened by the fact that Hamas is the one calling the shots right now, and that um, they're the ones that kind of have their hand on the on the faucet of our of our emotions of our. Um, uh you know disappointments as as the time ticked by yesterday for hours and hours without us knowing what was happening to this moment we don't really have good information on why there was the delay whether this was just some sort of psychological game or um actual mismanagement by our government of the swap um so i mean the atmosphere in israel is sort of hyper vigilant hypersensitive uh nationalism is at a peak right now i mean our cottage cheese mm. packages have israeli flags on them that say bring them home um our tissues have israeli flags on them saying we're all in this together public buildings have gigantic banners of israeli flags and uh, shows of support um so some of it seems a bit tacky and over the top and some of it um I mean, the TV that's being produced these days and the radio and just for, from a media point of view, the stories that are coming out of, uh, I mean, uh, both of the fighting on the 7th and of sort of harrowing and, and heartbreaking stories, but also a lot of stories of bravery and courage mm -hmm. and volunteerism that Itai was talking about a bit. Um, it's a huge mix of very, very evocative and powerful journalism and powerful stories um, that haven't been translated politically yet. And maybe that's the next stage we can talk about. But so far, there's this there's this feeling of, of togetherness that I think is starting to be eroded a little bit as time goes by and some cracks are starting to... Really? I'll, just, I'll just add on, on Elhanan's point, just I was in a shopping center the other day. And so even though we don't celebrate Thanksgiving in Israel, because obviously we're not American, for some reason we have Black Friday sales, but this year they were all called Blue Friday sales. And so all of the all of the signage was, I didn't know what Blue Friday was until I got a hundred ads for it thinking, why do I have to buy electronics today <laughs> for a 40% discount? But like that's even, even, 
even that is like part of the of the narrative yeah well i mean is it a unified israel i'm wondering how the uh, the different parts component parts of multicultural israel are managing particularly i'm thinking of arab israelis of course i just i mean i've heard some amazing stories uh, from friends here who've um, translated Haaretz for me and so on and so forth, terribly stirring, uh, terribly stirring about the Bedouin, for instance, and so on. But I'm just wondering how, how, what you see, what you see around you in terms of particularly Arab Israelis. Um, um, maybe, you can start sure. off. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, I think at first there was a lot of um, criticism and hypervigilance around comments by uh, Palestinian Israelis or Arab Israelis. Um, they're, they're in a really impossible situation right now right. because on the one hand, their uh, family members, their people are being, uh, are being, are being, are under severe attack in Gaza and they feel for them, that's their people. On the other hand, they're citizens of Israel, and I think like many of us, they they were disgusted and appalled by what happened on October 7th, um, which was also done in the name of their religion in many ways. Um, so I think it's a, it's a mix of very, very strong feelings. And there's been a harsh policing here of, you know, of, of comments, of tweets, um, of, of, of the media in some sense. Um, in workplaces, Jews and Arabs work together, so I think from what I've heard from my Jewish colleagues, it's been very, very tense in some situations, certainly at first. On the other hand, I think, um, well, first of all, also, of course, there have been Arab victims and Palestinian victims. Mm -hmm. There are mm -hmm. people who were kidnapped from the Bedouin community. Some of the first victims of the Hamas rockets on the first day or two of the attacks were Bedouin children and Bedouin mm -hmm. adults. Um, so it's a huge mix of emotion. Um, some people will fault them for not being outspoken enough on what Hamas did. Um, my view is that, given the the extent of casualties and the and and the heightened sort of death toll, the fact that this has not spilled into what happened tragically three years ago with the last Gaza confrontation mm -hmm. in 2021, where we had we were on the verge of civil war, or we could almost say we were sort of in a low grade le sort of a low grade level of civil unrest. In our mixed cities, that was my big fear when this started, that this would spill into Israel, and it and it hadn't, and it didn't spill into Israel, which is a small miracle in these very difficult times. And I think it's a testament both to the leadership of the Arab community, the lessons that they learn from the last round, but also uh, the shock that they're in, genuinely shocked and disgusted by what happened on October 7th. And for now, um, I mean, it's very tense, but but it hasn't spilled into violence. And I think also this needs to be translated into political action, um, especially given the very, very responsible responses by some of the Arab political leaders, namely Mansour Abbas, also mm -hmm. people like Ayman Ode, Ahmad Tibi, other politicians, they've been very good in sort of containing this. So sometimes silence is also a good thing when the alternative could be uh, much, much worse. Yes, I'm, I, I'm sure Hamas was expecting quite a different response. So this is in its yeah. own way quite a, a, yeah. a marvellous, um, you know, hit back. And what about you, Ate? How would you see it? Um, yeah, look, like Elchanan, I'm also very concerned about the freedom of speech issue that's that's happened since October 7th. You know, there was a teacher in Jerusalem, Mayor Baruch, and a civics teacher um, who was fired from his job over 15 Facebook posts, that each Facebook post was a picture of a child killed in Gaza. And he was saying, as you know, as a Jewish Israeli, why don't, why don't these stories interest us? Um, and he, police came to his house, took all of his computers, um, mm. did four days of interrogation, you know, over Facebook. I saw the Facebook posts, they weren't, you know, they, he doesn't support Hamas, he doesn't support October 7th. But to have that happen to you just because you're asking people to care for for the mm. lives of Palestinian children. I found very troubling. And then also what Elchanan said. There's so many stories. There's um, uh, I'm just I'm just looking here. Um, uh, Dalal Abu Amne. Um, she's a very popular Arab musician, and she uh, did a, a post on her Instagram saying there is no victor but but God with a Palestinian flag. Um, she was arrested for for that. 
Um, there was a friend mm-hmm. of Muhammad Dawal Chef from uh, Givat Khaviva who shared a post on Instagram with a picture of a house in Gaza on fire and just had the words until when. Um, and she was also brought in for questioning where a police officer speaking Arabic said to her, Sakret Imi, you know, shut your mouth, like you're not meant to mm-hmm. post this stuff, you know. So I think it's really important that we have the ability to express sympathy for like Jews should be able to express sympathy for people in Gaza and Palestinians should be able to express sympathy um, for for people in, in Gaza and in Israel, obviously, too. And and I feel like I think the the limits on that freedom of speech I find very troubling because we, as someone that works in peace building, you know, you can't have dialogue without free speech. If if people feel like their their speech is being policed, then then you can't talk to each other. And so I hope I understand why that exists during the war because as as El Khanan said, we're in a very patriotic moment and we don't want anyone to sort of mm. diminish the morale of the of the country and obviously Palestinians feel that on their side too but I think that needs to be balanced better with the importance of allowing people to to express uh, empathy for their own side and for the other side. I mean you're an Australian in Israel Ita. is there is there anything the diaspora here um, could be doing usefully i mean this is obviously a very important moment by the sound of both of you you know things that, that this is a tricky times any sort of um, obvious things to avoid uh, here in terms of what's said or not said yeah i mean i think even what you call this you know i, I noticed the age calls this an israeli palestinian conflict which i really don't like that terminology i think it's an israel hamas war i don't think we're a war with the palestinians mm. and so mm. i think it's really important to not use this as a war between um, Israel and the Palestinians, because I think there's million, as El Khanan said, look at Mansour Abbas, Simon Order, like all of the Arab Palestinian leadership in Israel have condemned this in some ways even more than some of the Palestinian leadership in Australia. So um, Dude, we've seen not, we've seen very little about yes, that, you know. Right? Yeah. So so I think um, you know there's millions of of, mm. of Palestinian Muslims who are citizens of Israel who have spoken out very forcefully against Hamas and how it's a violation of Islam and against their beliefs. And so I think it's really important, the language that you use around this, that you don't use this as an opportunity to demonize all Palestinians or all Muslims, um, especially people who are citizens of Israel. Um, as as El Khanan mentioned, there were, I think there were nine Arab hostages taken on October 7th. There were 22 Arabs killed. So this isn't this wasn't just a ta- an attack on on Jewish Israelis. So I think I think being aware of that in the language you use is is super important. And I, I'm going to call for questions in a moment. I just want to go back to Elhan. Um, what about the politics of this then, Elhan? Um, you know, can can you see it shifting things? I mean, h- how febrile is it? Yeah. So. Um... <clears throat> like hard politics have kind of been pushed to the back burner in the public discourse here in the media discourse. But um, one poll um, in the most important uh, commercial TV channel did come out last week, a week ago, um, a, um, sort of a, a, a viewership poll for um, popularity of the prime minister and, and government. And um, basically what we see is a giant inflation of the center in terms of what people will vote for. So you see a complete reversal in the seats, in the mandates that that, uh, Benny Gantz, who joined this government sort of on an emergency basis, um, gets compared to Netanyahu. Uh, Likud had, I think, 32 seats in the last elections just a year ago, just over a year ago. And uh, now now that there's a complete reversal, uh, Gantz gets 36 and Likud shrinks less Mm -hmm. than half or around half of what it had just a year ago to 17 seats and Lapid is strong with 15 and we see sort of this huge inflation of the, the Israeli center and we see a certain move to the extreme right with Ben Gvir, um, the most extreme element of our political map, getting seven seats. Interestingly, our finance minister Smotrich on the verge of extinction with only four kind of teetering around the eliminate the, the, the bar of elimination. But I think what this tells us is that the Israeli public, sort of broadly speaking, has kind of given up on 
political ideas of both sorts. They've given up on the right as a solution to its problems, which many people thought that they would vote for a full right wing party or coalition, and that would bring safety and security and stability. The exact opposite has happened since last year and really in unprecedented levels of um, decline and collapse. Um, but the left hasn't picked up the pieces, meaning mm. the left has not taken any of the popularity that the right has lost to rehabilitate itself. We don't see it pick up by the Labour Party, which is completely eliminated, or by Merits, which only, which is another left-wing party, which only rises very slightly in the polls. So what we have really is a public that feels like it wants to trust centrist leaders with maybe military credentials, but not the current uh, ideological sides, left or right. Um, I know we spoke about this before our discussion about how, how could this come about? How would elections come about? Now, the normal date for elections are only about three years down the road. They're not anytime soon. Um, there is a political possibility of changing the government without elections, but that's only if people from the coalition break away and substitute the prime minister with a different coalition. And that would only happen if you have um, most likely a Likud sort of defection of number of Likud party members. Um, that's the only realistic way that you could have change of power here without elections. Otherwise, the alternative would be Netanyahu uh, resigning and uh, dispersing the parliament, the Knesset, and then going to elections within 90 days. But that's really not in the books, I think, um, as long as the war is going on. Mm -hmm. And the question now is, what is the war and when will it end? In other words, mm -hmm. how long will it take? Um, at what stage is the war called off or is it finished? Let's say following the prisoner swap in a week or so, uh, reservists start getting called back and uh, released from duty. Um, does that mean the war is over? Because clearly Israel will still be in control of the northern Gaza Strip for foreseeable future, as long as there's no alternative. Um, so these are things that are still unclear, but I'm sure that as the war um, kind of deeper, you know, kind of tunes down, then uh, you'll have increased demonstrations against the government in full force, just as you had just before the war around the electoral reform. And those will just pick up again, I think, with a vengeance, with much more um, energy um, once the soldiers are back home. And can I ask you, is there any indication that you can see that Likud members are getting shaky and worried? Um, there's um, no, I don't hear that, but I wonder what's, what it's like there. Yeah, I mean, we've seen on the margins very kind of uh, shy and sheepish kind of uh, statements like people saying it's clear that this government won't last very long. Um, a, full, a sort of backbencher called Galit Istal Atbarian, who was kind of like a rabble rouser, Likud backbencher, was quoted uh, as saying that she's hugely disappointed in Netanyahu and he's her hugest dis biggest disappointment. And she sort of let this conversation on on WhatsApp leak to the media. Um, but other than these kind of very sheepish and kind of half-hearted, we don't see we don't see a real indication of defection because all these politicians know that their political futures probably rely on uh, Netanyahu's um, perseverance. Um, it, there, it is also possible that another party will decide to defect um, as as a group from the government. Um, I think ultra-orthodox parties like Shas, for example, have actually been given a pretty good rap and good feedback about their behavior and conduct as ministers during this war uh, could decide that they would fare better with Gantz, um, who is pretty favorable to them, and they could just decide to withdraw from the coalition and take sides with Gantz. So I'm not absolutely sure that the collapse of this government would come from within the Likud, yeah. but it's really kind of a question of who makes the exit first, sort of who, who decides to make his exit strategy first, and whoever does that will probably um, win all the chips, so to speak, of the public disgust and 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 you know um, frustration with this government. And those who won't take the initiative first will probably pay the price um, in the in the next elections. Oh, very interesting indeed. Now I notice we have do feel free to uh, uh, ask some questions because we I remember in the last 
uh, webinar, we had fabulous questions and it was really helpful. So one has come here from um, uh, Leora Benjamin. What have the speakers seen as the most positive Jewish Arab partnerships and activities at the moment? Would you would you like to take that, Ite? Yeah, and I would also say that I'm I work for the New Israel Fund as well now, part time in addition to Seeds of Peace. Um, and and I know there's two of our of our grantees, especially uh, in Rahat. Um, there's been a joint uh, Jewish Arab Hamal. Hamal kind of means like a war room, I guess, where people come and volunteer and then distribute goods um, to both Jews and Arabs in 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 Rahat, which is a which is a, a sort of unrecognized Bedouin village in the south. Um, there's been groups like Accord that have been doing a lot of uh, webinars and training on how to reduce, uh, let's say you work in a workplace that has Jews and Arabs, how do you work together at this time? They give various tools to companies and employees. How do you minimise uh, polarisation online? Standing Together as well has done some amazing work on having these Jewish Arab solidarity uh, summits. They've done six now uh, across the country with thousands of people. They've also oh, made. Where, uh, where do they do those online? Do they? No, no. They've been in person. There's been, oh, been in, in, in Jerusalem, right. in in Tel Aviv, Yafo, in Haifa, in Bakal Galbi, and in many other places um, to to sort of come and and give the people the opportunity to stand together and say we want to find a different way. We believe that you know when this war ends. There's still going to be 7 million Jews and 7 million Arabs living between the river and the sea. That's not going to change. And so and so when this war ends, we have to find some way to to still live together, to still share this country. And they and so a lot of their solidarity networks are trying to sort of think of ideas of, of how do we continue doing that after this war. Elhan, would you like to comment on what you've seen? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to add too much. He ties much more in the thick of things um, than I am. I'll just say, first of all, that these that these initiatives are so much more impressive today because the public mood of the majority in Israel is so opposed and but somewhat hostile even to these types of initiatives, I guess. Um, so to but see them happen. Are, are they at, the, at the moment? I don't know if hostile, that's maybe a strong word, but um, I'd say that the mood, the general mood here is not of cooperation and of ambivalence. cross-national solidarity. That's not the public mood. Mm -hmm. So to take part in those things is all the more impressive. I'll just mention another organization that I volunteer for, which is uh, Road to Recovery, which is um, an initiative that drives Palestinian patients from uh, checkpoints and um, on the border of the 67 border to um, Israeli hospitals for treatment. My first volunteering there was with uh, two children from Gaza, from the Eras Crossing. Yeah. I took them in March. Yeah. I, I don't know what the, the destiny of these two two-year-old children is. I don't know how they are in Gaza. My my heart goes out to them and my thoughts are with them. Um, but despite the fact that some of the main volunteers of this organization lived in those communities around Gaza that were attacked, including Vivian Silver, the famous peace activist who was murdered, um, and others who are still in captivity, some of the elderly women who were released were volunteers in this organization. Um, the, the organization is still is still transporting patients from the West Bank to Israeli hospitals in in the midst of this terrible mm -hmm. tragedy. Um, that's still going on. I'll just say a word about what I've been doing. I've from the first day of the war since I speak Arabic and still have some of my journalistic credentials. I've been giving sort of nonstop interviews on Arab media, um, which is also, I guess, a way of trying to connect the Jewish and Arab um, worlds somehow. Um, even this morning, I was on an interview on BBC an hour before this uh, this uh, webinar, mm -hmm. um, BBC Arabic. All of these interviews are just in Arabic. I've not given one English interview since wow. the beginning of the war, but only Arabic interviews, probably over 100, 120 wow. interviews. Wow. Is that right? Um, and and you received well? You received well? Um, well, I mean, it's hard to tell because it's really TV, so I don't get much mm. feedback. I don't know what mm -hmm. the viewer is thinking at home. Um some of them are a bit more heated, especially if there's a panel um, of, uh, you know, if they bring in a guest from Egypt or from Gaza or from Ramallah, then the discussion can get very heated sometimes. And of course, if there's a specific event, um, things were quite hostile after the hospital explosion in Gaza, which at first mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. all the channels immediately accused us and me by proxy of bombing a hospital. And then more information came out later, um, indicating that it was probably a stray rocket by Hamas or Jihad. But um, 
it varies. I think it's important for um, an Israeli Jewish voice uh, to be on these TV channels, if only, first of all, to bring Isra Israel's point of view, but also to be self-critical and to say, we've also made certain political mistakes. Hopefully, we will also change our leadership uh, after this war, which is my sincere opinion. And I think showing um, showing the Arab viewers that uh, we have a pluralism of opinion here in Israel. We don't all have to represent the government or, uh, I guess, the talking points during the war, but we can also say things that civil society feels, uh, you know, and mm. I think especially in this region that we're in where, where people are expected to toe the line, especially in a time of war, it's also important to have independent voices come out. So that's another mm. reason why I'm very insistent on speaking on TV these days. Oh, well, impressive. Now, look, there has been one question, which I'm going to put to you, Ite, first. Are people in Israel aware of the anti-Semitism that uh, uh, seems to have just grown like topsy, certainly is being felt in the wider world? Um, and I wonder how is, 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 there's just, is there's just too much on your mind in Israel to really consciously take yeah, this no, in? No, no, I not? think... I think there's definitely awareness of the anti-Semitism. It's not the top story here, but definitely what's going on on US college campuses is getting a lot of attention. Um, in fact, Israel put out a travel warning a few weeks ago telling Israelis not to visit diaspora Jewish communities wearing, <laughs> you know, Jewish or Israeli symbols, which is mm. crazy. You know, I've mm. I've never seen, you know, you know, especially after October 7th, you know, because the implication is that, you're not safe there and and they're telling israeli citizens not to visit you know sydney or melbourne or new york or um but then i also say look as as an australian i've uh, until six years ago i i lived in melbourne i speak to australian friends all the time and and i know many of them are on this call as well uh at, at you know are terrified to walk down flinders street on a sunday afternoon given mm -hmm. you know the kind of demonstrations that are that are happening there and and it's weird that i even though i'm in jerusalem i i often feel a lot safer than some of my jewish friends do in melbourne which is bizarre and i also feel like well, it's tragic i can do yeah i can do more mm. jewish muslim dialogue here i've been to four dialogue groups since the war began the first one organized by the sulcha we just sat and cried together for two hours over our losses and our pain and and I'm sad that so many interfaith groups in Australia have broken down um, mm. over this because I think I think security comes from many ways in Australia, and obviously one of them is is CSG and walls and you know metal detectors and all of that. But security also comes from people meeting Jews, from people knowing who we are, and no one's ever changed their opinion about a Jew because of CSG. You know the way mm. you. To me, the way you stop anti-Semitism is you you invite people into a living room and you show them, you invite them for Shabbat dinner. And I go to iftar meals in Muslim houses mm. and you have that human connection and then people say, wait, all those stereotypes they said about you, they're not true. Like we nice and kind and generous people and we help the poor and all of those sorts of things. And I think that sort of arsenal of fighting anti-Semitism, which for me is has so much of it is about human contact has really fallen apart during this war and that makes me really sad for, for Jews in Australia um, and also for, for Muslims and Christians in Australia that you know if you're not able to talk to each other and I and I understand why that exists during the war with with the heightened tensions and I hope that that can come back to life after the war. I think it's the shock my Jewish friends there particularly their children has had, they've had the most terrible shock that they just didn't think this was <sighs> going to afflict them you know given there's really been some would say a sort of a golden era of yeah. uh, of uh, jewish uh, involvement in the culture so it's that shock i think that yeah. that's almost like a double whammy <laughs> trying to yeah work like, that look, out. especially for i know jews in the arts feeling so unwelcome after they stood up for jews stood up for lgbt rights for indigenous mm -hmm. rights rights for um for, for workers rights you know all of these sorts of causes and now you know when we are under attack there's a sense of where's the solidarity with us so i you know i hear that a lot yeah mm. um do you want to say anything about that Ilhan, or not the, the yeah well i mean i'll just say quickly I, I just got back from um a visit a family visit to my brother who lives in brooklyn new york um, I, I got back last week and um 
Then suddenly I started seeing things from the perspective of diaspora Jews. You know, my brother's family, they educate their children in the Jewish school system, private school system. They go to synagogue and it's palpable that there's more security around schools. There's more security around synagogues. There's a police car is now parked outside of synagogues very visibly um, in the kind of quite posh neighborhood uh, where they're where they're living. Park Slope um, in Brooklyn, there was a big van vandalization, vandalizing of shops and graffiti just in the next uh, street over. But at the same week, there was this gi giant, um, unprecedented solidarity rally in Washington, D.C., which all the communities from around uh, the East Coast and across the United States traveled to. And uh, the numbers ended up being 300,000 plus uh, participants, which mm -hmm. I think was important for them to strengthen their sense of togetherness and resilience kind of in the face of what Itai was, was um, describing now in Australia as a sense of maybe betrayal of being kind of alone um, not only by, of course, um, you know, let's say Arab, uh, Palestinian, pro-Palestinian groups, but especially by uh, the liberal left. I think that was very painful for people mm. in the diaspora, um, which, which resulted in, in, I think, maybe an opposite problem where they invited extreme rights, people like Hagee, like, you know, from the evangelical kind of extreme right to speak at this rally, which I'm also not sure. <laughs> is the best mm. solution is to side with um you know the other extreme um but there's there's a, there's a sense of vulnerability among diaspora Jews that I haven't seen before and it's difficult for them also they also feel very alone and very vulnerable especially around people ripping down posters it's, it's a symbolic act but the uh, the posters of the um kidnapped Israelis who have been ripped off and torn in in the US is kind of been mm. very visible um, mm, as a symbol yeah, no. of this, I think. Oh, look, we could spend a whole, a whole webinar talking uh, yeah. about about this. Um, look, uh, there's another very interesting question um, that has been put: that is it possible the protests in the West might uh, hinder the, uh, say, the possibilities for peacemaking between, say, that, that are sort of definitely there, though you know, in, in playing a somewhat subterranean role at the moment between, say, the Saudis and the Egyptians, because it's quite plain, one of the sort of, I'm really fascinated by the consensus that of all the commentators I hear on various um, podcasts and so on I listen to, when they're asked, does the region still want to promote um, uh, relations with Israel? And the overwhelming sense is yes, and certainly yes, they do. Um, you know, at the certainly at the leadership level. Now, do you think in any shape or form that just the sight of we had more protests on the street in uh, Sydney and Melbourne today and Brisbane, might that undermine those green shoots? Um, I wonder, I wonder how people living in Israel feel about that. Um, can I go first, Titai? Yes, you yeah, go sure. ahead, Alan. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, firstly, I don't think that the Saudis, well, that's the people we're really talking about now is the Saudis. Yes, really, I don't think yeah. they care. I don't think they I don't think they're affected so much by demonstrations in Western cities regarding whether or not they should normalize with Israel. Their 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 interests are are hugely strategic here, um, namely trying to counter Iran um and its influence, which has become even more evident, I think, around this conflict, not only with Gaza, but also the flare-up in the north with Hezbollah become quite obvious that a more significant danger from Iran is not just the nuclear danger, but also the, the conventional danger of proxies and, uh, and and weapons that are being transferred to um, to uh, to bad players like Hamas and Hezbollah. So I think, if anything, Saudi Arabia's motivation to side with the West and side with Israel has only grown. But I want to add to that that from an Israeli perspective, the idea of normalizing with the region, I think now has again become less relevant because what we in the left sort of have been saying all along was that Saudi Arabia was never Israel's real enemy. And whether or not we can fly over Saudi Arabia or visit Jeddah for tourism is much less consequential to our lives than whether we can have a stable Palestinian neighbor uh, that will not attack our communities and with which we can live in peace side by side. That's the existential question. The existential mm. question is not whether Saudi Arabia will normalize with us. 
which is what Netanyahu has always been trying to convince Israelis, is that once the Arab world normalizes with us, the Palestinians will somehow magically either disappear or fall into line or capitulate, mm -hmm. which is patently and clearly the biggest strategic flaw of his policy. What we really need is normalizing with the Palestinians under a pragmatic leadership. It's hard to see that leadership right now. Mahmoud Abbas has been silent and very weak and even reluctant to retake um, control over the, over the Gaza Strip. It's a big unknown, but what we really, really, really need to be working for right now as Israelis is strategizing as to who will take over Gaza after we eliminate Hamas, if that's even possible. But is, is, isn't that where you might need Saudi and Egypt? So no, because I think, I mean, Egypt now already is is on our side with uh, trying to crush Hamas. And, you know, it, it hasn't objected to any of Israel's um, no. military moves in any significant mm -hmm. way. It's playing ball with our inspections of trucks coming into the Gaza Strip. Israel, Egypt has put no obstacle. Yes, we do need regional partners to support a peace bid. But if we don't have a pragmatic leadership on the Palestinian side who controls both territories, both Gaza and the West Bank, who we can make a deal with and convince Israelis to um, trust, then, I mean, I think now it's more clear than ever that what we really need is good is good neighbors and good leadership on our neighbors. Mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia can wait, but you know, yeah. we really, okay. really need to think about the day after Gaza. Yep. Yeah. Um, I, I it, just want to add. A, yeah, I'll just add a word on street protests. You know, I. I think whenever I write about street protests, I'm reminded of this story of David Grossman. He's a very well-known Israeli author. And he was once asked, why do you go to street protests? And he shared a story of a, a man that protested against the Vietnam War back in the 1950s, right at the start. And he went to the White House every Friday with a candle. And it was a one-man protest initially. And, and they said to him, what are you sitting here with a candle? That's not going to stop the Vietnam War. And then the guy says, well, I can't stop the Vietnam War, but I can stop the Vietnam War from changing me. And, and what he means by that is you go to a protest because you see all the world around you is hell and you say, I don't want to let this affect me, so I want to stand against this. I want to say this is not in my name, this is not in my beliefs, or I'm for this. And sometimes that, you know, articulates itself as a, as a three-word slogan, you know, free Palestine or free the hostages in the case of the rallies you see in Melbourne. And, um, and, I, and I, think, I think protest is very cathartic and it's very important when you feel like you can't do anything to be able to go to a protest and have thousands of people around you with your flag and your slogan because it feels like I did something, but look, I'm of the view that I, I, I don't like either of them. You know, I, I, I'm of the view that I think for there to be peace here, clearly Hamas needs to be defeated. Like there's there's going to be no peace if Hamas remains in power, but there's also going to be no peace if the occupation of the West Bank continues and the siege on Gaza continues. And and the protests that kind of I want to see happen are protests that, that call for, for all three of those things to happen and they're obviously not happening there was one in london actually organized by a group called hope for humanity but um you know there's not many of them happening in in australia interestingly they are happening here though um groups like standing together you know again are mm -hmm. able to bring together jews and arabs not necessarily in demonstrations but in these solidarity meetings in dialogue groups in you know, a demonstration is not a great place for nuance. It's not a place to, you no, know, articulate no. a, it's a, it's a place to yell and scream and, you know, have signs and slogans. But I think beyond the protest, you know, the people that want to share this country in peace, there's millions of them here. Okay. They're not in the political leadership of either Israel or mm. Palestine, but there's millions of people here that know that our future is not one where, you know, whoever has the biggest gun wins, you know, that's no, not what we right. want to create here. Um, and, and yeah, that's our future. And I, I just want to say one other word on guns. I know it's not a question, but I really think it's important that people know since the war, Itamar ben our Minister of Financial Security, has loosened the gun laws in Israel. That means that it used to be very hard to get a gun, and now it's very mm -hmm. easy to get a gun. Basically, anyone that's done one year of combat service or two years of national service, which is basically every Jewish Israeli except, um, except for the Haredim and, and the Arabs, um, is is now able to get a gun. So 250,000 Israelis have taken out gun licenses and 97% of them are men. Um, and that's also something I'm very concerned about. I know a lot of women's groups in Israel have, have alerted the fact that the fact that a lot of the people that 
there's no requirement to you know to check if you have mm. any record of domestic violence before you get a gun license and i'm very worried about I, i'm seeing in jerusalem so many guns now that i've never seen before and again i understand why people want to have a need for guns especially after october 7th when you know hamas literally came into people's houses and because they mm. were unarmed that's what happens there and i get I get the need that so many Israelis want to have guns because we don't know where the next October 7th will be, but I'm also worried about a proliferation of guns in our society and what that does to to families and, and other people that have, you know, anger management issues and, and those sorts of things. So I think that's also a legacy of the war that I'm very worried about. Look, we've only got about two minutes to go, and I just want... I, I Sue Black has asked, and I'll, I'll ask um, Elhanan, uh, what about releasing someone like Marwan Barghouti? Like, is there, in terms of breakthrough, circuit breaking, um, not maybe not quite yet, but imminent, would you say that that might achieve something if Abbas is looking so sort of, I don't know, you know, um, yeah. um, inadequate? I'll say this. Yeah, I, I think I think that that's the right direction of thinking. In other words, I don't know if him specifically or someone who has credibility and, and you know, um, gravitas, both with the more moderates and the more hard line and can take control of both sides, but can also be pragmatic and settle on a two-state solution. Um, I don't know if Marwan Barghouti is that person. It could be that it won't be even our choice because who knows, God knows, maybe at the end of this prisoner swap, he'll be one of the people on the list and we won't have much of a say about it. But I think we can maybe try to turn lemons into lemonade and try to work with people like that. Um, the bottom line is we need we need to um, to work with people who have credibility on the Palestinian street. And um, I don't think it'll be Netanyahu who will realize that. So a lot of the things that are coming out of Netanyahu about who will manage Gaza in the day after, um, mm -hmm. I don't take much you know credence. I mean, I, I don't take it. I take it with a grain of salt because he's not going to be the one calling the shots. I believe in a year from now. So um, yes, I think, I think that's that's something that Israel should consider is is releasing people like him. Yeah, yeah, with the, with the gravitas. Um, okay, look, I I just love to go on, but I can't. <laughs> regrettably, look, thank you very much. I think we have. Well, I've certainly learned a lot. Uh, so, look, good luck, uh, Rabbi Elhan, Elhanan, pardon me, and Ite Flesher. Thank you so much. I hope we can do this again. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you indeed. very much. That thanks, Geraldine. Lovely. Thank you. Bye-bye. And uh, thanks to all for joining in. I'm sorry to those questions we couldn't get to you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.